One of the things we talked about was how to find a limit when you can't directly substitute. Notice for this limit, if I try to plug in 1, I get a 0 in the denominator. 1 is not in the domain of this function, so I cannot simply plug it in to find the limit. What I can do is I can simplify. The top is x minus 1 squared, and we learned in the previous class that we're allowed to simplify. So now I just have to look at the limit as x goes to 1 of x minus 1, and now 1 is in the domain, so I can directly plug it in, and this limit is equal to 0. Sometimes you can't simplify and cancel, and it's useful to think about cake. For this limit, again, I cannot just directly substitute because 1 is not in the domain. But consider what happens when x gets very close to 1. The top gets very close to 2, and the bottom is a very, 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 very small positive number. So if I have about two pieces of cake, and every piece that I cut is very, 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 very small, I'm going to have a large number of pieces. So this is going to look like positive or negative infinity, and the only thing we have to be careful of is the sign. Now the top is always going to be positive when x is close to 1, and the bottom also is going to be positive because it's got that squared in there. So this limit is going to be positive infinity, and you don't have to write the plus, but you can if you want. Another thing we talked about was the squeeze theorem. Let's say I'm trying to evaluate a limit like this. Well, it's got two parts that are multiplied together, so we might want to try just finding the limit of this left part and finding the limit of this right part. The left part, of course, just goes to zero, but the right part I can't directly substitute. I can't just plug it in because when x is zero, sine of x is zero, and I'm not allowed to divide by zero. What I can do, though, is I can realize that this function is squeezed between two other functions. Remember, cosine of anything, this is cosine of something crazy, but cosine of anything you want is always going to be between 1 and minus 1. So that means my function is always going to be between x squared and minus x squared. Now as x goes to 0, both of these things also go to 0. So because my function is between two things that squeeze down to the same point by the squeeze theorem, the limit of my function is also 0. We learned that a function is continuous at a point if the value of the function at, a, at that point and the limit of the function as x goes to that point are the same. And of course this implies that both of them exist. We saw three different kinds of discontinuities. One is a removable discontinuity, which is where the limit exists, but it's not equal to the function. Maybe the function is undefined, or maybe the function uh, has a different value. Another kind of discontinuity we saw was a jump discontinuity. That's when the limit from the left exists, and the limit from the right exists, but they don't match up. The third kind of discontinuity we saw was an infinite discon discontinuity. That's when my limit goes to infinity, which is a way of not existing. And if the limit doesn't exist, then certainly it can't be equal to the value. Most of the functions we're used to are continuous over their domain. The thing you have to be a little bit careful of is piecewise defined functions. For example, if I have the function sine x divided by x plus 1, its domain is everything except minus 1. So it's continuous everywhere except at minus 1. We used this idea of continuity to talk about the intermediate value theorem. Let's say I have a continuous function, and I see what it is at two points. At a, it's f of a, and at b, it's f of b. Well, if it's continuous from a to b, what that guarantees us is that when I go from a to b in the x direction, in the y direction, I have to pass through every y value between a and b. So no matter what horizontal line I draw, if I'm going to draw a continuous function from a to b, it has to, at some point, cross that line. Now maybe it crosses it lots of times, or maybe it crosses it only once, but at some point it crosses that line. So what that means is that 
for whichever y between f of a and f of b I choose, there exists a c so that f of c is equal to y. One great use of the intermediate value theorem is in finding roots. Let's say I have a function, and I can't factor it easily. I don't know what its roots are. Well, I can start taking points, and if at any time my function is positive and then negative, then I know somewhere in here a root exists, a place where the function is zero. Now, if I want to refine it a little more, I can keep taking parts. So I know that somewhere inside here there's a root, so let me test right in the middle. And let's say the function is positive there. If the function is positive there, then now I know, well, I can hunt for my root inside here. So I can take another point inside there. Let's say I take here, and let's say the function is negative. Well, now I know that somewhere in here, my root exists. Now, usually you can't exactly find the root by doing this, but you can estimate it very, very closely.